from the internet, the International Jack Benny Fan Club presents the fourth annual Jack Benny Convention. All right, folks, welcome back. I'm going to bring on a friend of mine here, the co-producer of the Benny Convention, Mr. Mrs. Hope Sears, not Mr. Miss Hope Sears. Hello, folks. Hello, Hope. Um, <laughs> um, so we're just pretty much going to say, I'm just pretty much here to say that um, we interviewed Noel Blank. How amazing is that? Um, who is, he is the son of Mel Blank, who did a lot of sound effects for Benny and the radio shows and later uh, came on as a player in the uh, TV shows and uh, was also a voice of several Looney Tunes. So uh, we're just gonna, this is a tight segment here. So we're just gonna dump right into uh, this interview and let it speak for itself because it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I'm Walton Hughes, and it's always a pleasure to have this gentleman on the line. No blank. Welcome to the Jack Benny Convention. Hey, what's up, Jack? <laughs> Boy, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be part of the Jack Benny Convention. Uh, what's your favorite memory of Jack Benny? Yeah, <laughs> I really do have a favorite. Uh, even though we saw him so many times, he came by the house, we came by there. Uh, when my dad had that terrible automobile crash in 1961, he was at the hospital there almost every day. I'd pick him up in my little car, which he had to fold onto himself. It was a little Porsche at that time. And uh, we brought him over to the hotel every day so he could see Mel. But my favorite thing about Jack Benny was happened in, in 1948. Jack and his daughter Joni and her friend Hannah came up to... Uh, Big Bear, because Jack and Dad and George Burns had loved Big Bear in the uh, winter time. My dad built the cabin in 1946, so it was there and ready when they came up in 1948 in the summer. And uh, Joni, his daughter, was a terrific water skier. We take her water skiing. First two days, she must have gone out ten times. And Jack says, "You know, I'd like to try that." And we looked at each other and said, "Uh oh." We said, okay, Jack, we'll give you an idea lesson on the dock. So we gave him a, a skiing lesson on the dock. He says, I don't know if this life preserver is big enough. So I walked back up to the house and got this giant Navy life floating jacket. I mean, it was something that would keep a small battleship afloat. Gave it to Jack. He put it on. You could barely see him through it. And he said, we... Uh, you know, gave him a lesson on how to hold the baton and what was going to happen and that he would take a dock start and it would be very easy. And so he, we, the rope started to be pulled out. Hi, everybody. I'm Walton Hughes. And you're <laughs> Professor LeBlanc. <laughs> It is a character based in suffering. I love it. <laughs> oh, yes. Total suffering. Every time they had a lesson together, uh, it was absolute suffering for Professor LeBlanc. And the little uh, rhymes that they did, the dun, 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 you know, what, uh, one and two and three and four and one, you know, whatever he said, the rhyming was wonderful. George Bolzer wrote those rhymes for Professor LeBlanc after the Jack Minnie show quit. Uh, I actually hired George Balzer for our writing in 1966. Wow. Blank Communications. And we, lovely man, George Balzer. They, uh, you know, the whole gang at Jack Benny was just wonderful. Everybody loved everybody else. They loved getting together. They liked sitting around this big living room in the office uh, with the writers. He was just a wonderful man to love. He gave nothing but love, and he would take his time. I'll tell you one more story. Uh, Jack came over to the house after my dad's accident, and he was going to have Mel uh, appear for the first time uh, in a cast on the next show. And he knew, Jack Benny knew how much I adored uh, Marilyn Monroe and, of course, all the kids at that time. We weren't kids, you know, we were probably in our teens. How much he, we all thought Marilyn Monroe was just a living in. And uh, he says, you know, we're going to have her on the show this week and Mel's going to be on the show too. So 
why don't you come down with your dad and uh, I'll take you backstage. You can meet Marilyn. I said, oh my gosh, that sounds fantastic. So dad took me down to the show and he was on the show. It was, it was a great show because Mel had been in the automobile accident and uh, had just gotten over in 1961. This was the first show he's done since uh, early 61. This is mid 61. And uh, after the show, I walked backstage or was going to walk backstage to meet Marilyn Monroe. And Marilyn Monroe came running out, throwing her arms around me and says, I've been wanting to meet you, Noel, for so long. Jack had put her up to that. But that's the kind of guy Jack was. He knew I was waiting to meet her. <laughs> <laughs> and he had her running out and throwing her arms around me and saying, I've been wanting to meet you so long. But that's the kind of uh, wonderful type of practical jokes that Jack would play. Oh, that's a lovely story. I think I'd probably be taken aback in that moment and be like, what? <laughs> oh, I, I must have been absolutely bright red. I, could, <laughs> but I remember every instant of it. It was really <laughs> funny. I know that uh, people would come up to your uh, for Halloween and, and have your dad do voices. Do you do anything to kind of continue that legacy there? Yes, you know, I did for uh, over 30 years in Beverly Hills uh, because um, I had a house that I bought practically for nothing from Bobby Darren in 1968. And I mean, literally practically nothing. That was one of the best lots on, in Beverly Hills, but it was on the corner of Rodeo Drive, uh, which wasn't really known that much at that time, but it was a corner lot on Rodeo Drive, two blocks up from uh, where now Gucci and that whole bunch of things are. And uh, the kids would be bussed in from all over uh, Southern California area to Los Angeles and then to Beverly Hills because they knew that was where the best candy was. So even though my dad and my mom would get these hundreds of people starting at two o'clock, I mean, literally hundreds, and end up at about nine, at Beverly Hills on that corner lot, the trick-or-treaters started about, uh, oh, four o'clock. And I figured at one time we had about uh, 1,800, almost 2,000 trick-or-treaters. And, and of course, my dad and mom had more than that. But because they came to see Mel Blanc and get candy. In Beverly Hills, they just came to that great corner house. <laughs> and that was it, a circular driveway. The little school buses would come in and everything else. And you'd get you know, 30, 40 kids at a time. And an interesting thing, at that time, uh, Hugh Hefner used to bring his kids over so that they would know what trick-or-treating was because he spent all his time at the mansion at that time. And he wanted the kids to really realize what trick-or-treating was. So the, the Hefner boys, who are now, um, I guess, 30 years old, they'd come over and give out the candy at our house. I was seeing someone had posted a video of you um, doing announcements at, at Big Bear Lake and your Bugs Funny voice. Oh, Bugs Porky Daffy Tweety Sylvester. Mm -hmm. My dad started that. Mm -hmm. just about the time that Jack Benny first came up because they found out that my dad was in that cabin with my mom and me and uh, he would come out with a megaphone uh, you know Rudy Valley kind of megaphone that didn't have electricity in it like mine does <laughs> and he'd come out and do all the characters and there was one tour boat at that time he'd come by about three times and he'd come out each time because it sat in this in our cove which was we bought for six hundred dollars the, the lot there and it's about the best lot on the lake and it's six it was six hundred bucks and we built this little cabin there which didn't cost much more than that and that's where we've been for 77 years half the year we spent up there and now uh the tour boats being five in total and some of them will come by three to four to five times a day i'm out on the porch all the time because if they do stop and they do every day and every time they're out i go out and do the same thing that my dad used to do and that's what you saw is there anything that you would like people to know about your dad's friendship with jack because i mean they seem like best friends being out there on the lake together yes they were such close friends you know there was one thing jack didn't like to drive to palm springs and they'd have the radio show there twice a year so what he would do is ask Mel to drive him to Palm Springs 
so Jack would be on the front seat with Mel and I'd be in the back seat with my mom. And we would take them there each time they had to go to Palm Springs to do the show because he knew George, even though he loved to drive, was a dreadful driver. And Mel was a great driver. So he would, we'd go over and pick him up and take him to Palm Springs. And of course, it was nothing but laughs all the way to Palm Springs. So yeah, we had great times with Jack. He'd come over to the house, especially when Mel wasn't able to get to the show after the accident. He wasn't able to get on the show for about eight months. So Jack would come over every, you know, I guess it was Friday and uh, have dinner with us. It was uh, really a nice friendship that they had. I was lucky to be there, be part of it. I, I just realized something, Noel. Your dad's legend and and the mythic quality he possesses with his voice talents is realized that friendship with jack might have helped propel it because your dad would get challenged by jack a lot to be like i that's bet right. you can't do this voice <laughs> like, <laughs> that's right and it started with the bear that guarded his safe carmichael. in the house carmichael the bear yeah. so it was a challenge to do the bear growl but my dad did a great growl that and the Maxwell are two of the sound effects that I hear and go, I don't know how your voice does that, but you do it. And in fact, your dad's uh, puttering Maxwell voice is used in Looney Tunes Back in Action, I believe, where it's, it, again, you you hear it in the movie and you're like, that's not a sound effect, that's Mel. Like, it's, it's oh, unmistakably yeah. him, yeah. And his parrot sounded just like a bird. In fact, any movie that was done with a parrot in it around that time and for maybe 20, 25 years there, uh, <laughs> they would have to call Mel because that was the parrot voice. Wow, that's remarkable. So there were a lot of movies hmm. with him doing a parrot. <laughs> and what do what... you remember about Palm Springs? No, did, where did you guys stay in the 40s? You remember where? Jack uh, stayed at the Biltmore Hotel there. Uh, we stayed at a little place in town, and he'd be there at the Biltmore every time they went to Palm Springs. They had a great time there. He'd do all rehearsals there at the Biltmore. That's when the Motel 6 had just gone up and the hotel rooms were $6, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> across the street from the Biltmore. You know, they all took the trains back together to New York when they used to do the shows out in New York, usually once a year. Mm -hmm. They all took the Super Chief out of Los Angeles all the way to New York. I don't know, the, boy, that must have been fun, being on the train with all of them for three days. That had to be a lot of fun. Did you have a favorite character on the Japanese show? I mean, the Frank Nelson, the Phil Harris, any, any of them were you, you particularly like as a person? Uh, they... I liked Artie Arbach and Mr. Kitzel. And I liked Frank uh, Nelson, of course. And yeah. he, he is, he had that wonderful voice. And it's interesting because Frank Nelson was on my dad's radio show. Uh, the Bob Bremel there. Uh, and the, the guy that, uh, I don't smell flowers, they smell me. He did wonderful characters on the show. And of course, Rochester, Eddie Anderson was just the best. He was a great car enthusiast, by the way, Eddie Anderson. Had a, a homemade, uh, or he, he built it himself, a custom automobile in the uh, late 40s hmm. that, that he drove in the Santa Claus Lane Parade, which my dad was always in that with Jack. Jack gave himself to so many things, doing the concerts, all the wonderful uh, institutions that have him give, give uh, concerts, uh, violin concerts, and he'd give all the money to the uh, that society, all the symphony orchestras of, uh, yeah, I'm, he must have played a hundred symphony orchestras and gave the money to them. Did your dad ever get a chance to go to one of those con benefit concerts that Jack gave, or was that just something he'd like know about? No, we were at, uh, he gave a couple of them that we were at in the Los Angeles area. <laughs> Did you, do you remember he, anything specific from the concerts? Well, Jack was very funny at <laughs> the concerts, that was for sure. He, he had some great writing that he'd, uh, I guess, I don't know if you've heard any of the concerts, but he had some great things to say at the beginning and at the end. And I thought it was uh, wonderful what he would do uh, with the funds that were collected at the concerts. There's a couple of them that exist. And what I like hearing is like, I've heard the stories about you get the, they got the violin out there and the janitor can play the violin better than him. Um, but, <laughs> but like, I actually, this is, here's a question is like, when you listen to Jack play, 
Like, what did you think of his playing? He wasn't Isaac Stern at that time, but he was a, <laughs> but he was a heck of a violinist. Mm. He was a really good violinist, and he practiced a lot. Then he knew he was no Isaac Stern, even though he did an album with Isaac Stern. Did your dad play a uh, violin as well? Did they ever talk about playing? My dad didn't play anywhere near as well as Jack Benny, although uh, at night would come, and they'd both get their violins out, up at Big Bear with the kids. Uh, Tony played the ukulele, I played the piano, but I couldn't bring the piano out on the porch. So I just sat there and listened. And they'd have their own little jam session. And when George Burns would come up, he'd try to sing because he thought he was a great singer, but he wasn't much of a singer. <laughs> uh, but he would have fun trying to keep up with Jack and the violin with his voice. So it was, yeah, it was a fun time sitting out on the porch on uh, those wonderful summer nights up at Big Bear. And out of all the same furniture they sat on, my uh, wife and I, my wife Catherine and myself, kept all the same furniture, the same wall, exactly the same as it was uh, 77 years ago. And the photos and everything. It's like a little museum up there. And we spent about six months out of the year up there. Did your dad play any other instruments? My dad started playing a uh, tuba, and then he was the youngest orchestra leader, symphony orchestra leader in the Northwest at 19 years old at that time. Uh, and he could play, he was the MC, but he could also play tuba, which he played before. Then he played violin, he played bass, and tinkled around a bit with the piano. He had perfect pitch, you know, Why? Mel did. My dad had just amazing pitch. You could sit on the keys of the piano, he'd tell you what keys you were sitting on. And then he could do the cartoon voices in, in the perfect voices and sing Harmony, nine-part harmony, I've had him, and many things that we did for Warner Brothers. He could do nine-part harmony with the characters, with just the lead sheet for Bugs Bunny. He could harmonize because of his perfect pitch. Your dad had an ability to do something that I don't think any voice actor is able to do today. And I didn't, I never realized it until it was pointed out in the documentary that was made about your dad for, I believe, Warner Brothers. I think it was Hank Kazaria who said this. It's in one of the Hunter cartoons, but your dad was able to do Daffy Duck as Bugs Bunny and Bugs Bunny as Daffy Duck. <laughs> yeah, but nobody can understand how he could do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I've <laughs> listened to it. I put it in, like, in an editing program and tried to, fit, like, break it down, and I'm like, I can't. I, I don't understand how he did it. <laughs> yeah. You know why? Because he he became the characters mm -hmm. he was really uh, a stanislavski method actor and didn't know it mm -hmm. but he really mm -hmm. did become the characters you could turn the sound off in the sound booth while he was recording and he'd be doing the different characters and as he did them each character he looked he metamorphosized or transmorph transmogrified himself one of the two words into uh, the characters when he did Tweety, he became a little bird. When he did Yosemite Sam, he looked like Yosemite Sam. And he had that great rubber face. He looked like the characters that he did. He got to that point in the characters where, like, and it, it goes back to Jack challenging him, too. Like, he somehow would be able to pull something out that you weren't expecting, and he would still become that in the process. The, the English yeah. horse story is one of my favorites because it, it oh, yeah. challenged your dad to come up with and, cr and become a character on the spot. <laughs> Yes. You know, I just copy a few of the voices. Uh, he did every dialect from every country, and they were all perfect. There were so many, even uh, just differences in the, in, a, in the United States, the South, the West, the West, the Midwest, you know, Boston, New York. He could do any of those and sound like he's from those places, as opposed to most of the voice actors, or all the voice actors. Uh, nobody did dialects like Mel. Yeah, not even Dennis could compare. Yeah, and Dennis was good at dialect. Dennis was great. You know, Jack had such great uh, people on the show. Mary Livingston was an incredible foil. She was great when you really listened to her and what she could do uh, with Jack was just terrific. Agreed. Yeah, people don't realize how good she was. She never really liked being on uh, television or radio, but uh, when she was, she was terrific. I was just wondering if that transformation of 
uh, the faces that he would make when it, is that part of the process for that? Uh, if, if you're really good, it is, I think, sure. But I think it's difficult to become the character because mm -hmm. you have to invent the character to become the character whenever you need it. Uh, copying the characters uh, are a lot different because you've got a voice that's already been, uh, you know, laid out for you and you're just trying to sound like the character. You don't have to have the personality or that uh, internal uh, feeling of being the character. I think Mel, uh, when he did those characters, he became those characters. I was, going, I was wondering, Noel, yeah. if, you talk, if you take a character from scratch, if you're creating the character the first time, did your dad take a little while to think about it before he jumped in and created, or did he do it right on the spot? Uh, some he did on the spot, some he had to really take his time with. And some he had to modify uh, from the beginning. Bugs didn't sound anything like it because the, the, the pictures of Bugs Bunny had big teeth sticking out in front. So mm -hmm. the first, uh, you hear the first uh, uh, few Bugs Bunny sounded like this. And what's up, Doc? And, and it wasn't, uh, and what's up, Doc? Kind of a thing. Uh, because he was he saw the big teeth. And eventually, they brought the teeth in, and so Bugs Bunny's voice changed after the first year or two. So the artist had a lot to do with it, mm. too. Obviously, your your father was an indelible legacy with Warner Brothers cartoons, but um, the one uh, cartoon where he probably does the least, that I would argue, is The Mouse That Jack Built. Were you around at the time that they went ahead and did that cartoon, Noel? I, I wasn't in the studio when they did that, but Jack always wanted to be in a cartoon. Wow. So he yeah. had the chance. And they were on stage 14. Everybody that was around in Warner Brothers at the time came to look at them to do a, a, a together. It's the one time where your dad is really just, it's, he's just there to do the Maxwell, and that's pretty much it. But it's that's about it. Yeah. The more I listen to it, I appreciate his imitation of Jack and Hollywood Daffy, um, <laughs> where he's at a, a vending machine and goes, darn it, I'll never get one of those things. And <laughs> I, re I remember hearing it going like, oh, it's not my favorite imitation he's done. But the more I hear it, the more I'm like, nah, he he's nailing every syllable of Jack. <laughs> you know, it's like every everything's down to a T. Well, he, he didn't like to copy anybody, you know, any living person, uh, but he, and he never did. He liked to sing like Al Jolson, but he did it in a comedy way. Right. Mm -hmm. Two or three records that sounded like Al Jolson. That kind of explains his imitation of Jack, too, for that one cartoon. It's like he's not, he's not strictly doing Jack. He's doing a, a, an amped up version of Jack, that's, per se. That's it. Okay. And we didn't mention Don Wilson. What oh, yeah. a great talent he was. Also. Oh, yeah. Jack, Jack just had the best cast. I think there's like two people in this world that can't be Im uh, that imitated or duplicated perfectly. One is one is your father, and the other one's Phil Harris's voice. I've never found anybody who can do Phil Harris's voice. I was going to mention Phil Harris. Wasn't he funny? And he, oh. he was just and a wonderful guy. He was just a lot of fun all the time. So oh, the whole cast was great, and all the writers were terrific. You know, <laughs> you couldn't ask. It was like putting together over there at uh, Termite Terrace all that great talent together to provide those cartoons, which are still so popular today. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason that people don't forget the name or anything and that Bugs Bunny is as popular now as he was 80 years ago, 85 years ago, is because they don't age. And they appear to look the same all their lives. And they mm -hmm. can make new material for 80, 85 years. They're ageless. You know, it's funny, like the metric we always measure it by is your father's performances, the new Looney Tunes cartoons that have been coming out through HBO Max, like, you know, like you, you, the, the metric that I went by was, okay, how close are they getting to Mel? And I was shocked about how many got so close, um, but never quite there, but they just, they managed to do your dad's characters justice. Well, Jeff Bergman is as good as I've seen. And of course, they don't let him do it alone because they don't want to pay. He can do everything, though. In fact, he's doing some, he's doing Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble in a series. He can sound like anybody. He's the best copy person I've ever seen. No, no one even close to Jeff Bergman. So it's a, it's a person you should look up in because yeah. he can do Mel's speaking voice. And it scares the heck out of him. <laughs> when I know Jeff I mean, Bergman's work, but I didn't know he could do Mel's voice. <laughs> <laughs> he could do male talking. Well, if you listen to Sylvester, 
that Mel doing Sylvester. Oh, yeah. He t- takes on Mel's voice, mm-hmm. and then he does the characters. But he can oh. do that with uh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan <laughs> Freeman have him do his own pickup lines in a film that he had uh, laryngitis. He called Jeff Bergman in, and they talked for a while, and then Jeff sat down before a mar- microphone. You couldn't tell the difference between him and Morgan Freeman. Wow. Yeah, an, an amazing ear and, and a terrific guy. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Well, oh. well, thank you for doing this. You're always so gracious for doing well, it. Well, thanks for calling. I appreciate talking about Jack Benny, that's for sure. Yeah. It would be, it would be, yeah, that's all, folks. <laughs> thank later. you. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Mm-hmm. Bye bye. That might be one of the most fun quick interviews i've ever gotten to do like i was very very like i i remember being rushed that day for other things i had going on so i was like ah, i guess I, I i don't know if i'm going to be able to like sit down and fully ask everything i'd want to ask but man like it, it's he's such a wonderful guy to chat with and his the the stories about his father <clears throat> um and jack together are things that i always just enjoy listening to Hope, what did you, uh, what what was your favorite part of that experience? Because I know you were researching Mel a lot not too long ago. Um, I, I actually just liked the, they didn't have it in the, there, but the, when he picked up the phone to uh, start the interview with us, he um, was using his voices to talk to me. And mm-hmm. that was just surreal. Um, yeah, <laughs> but my favorite part of that interview, I think, was just um, learning a couple of the stories that I hadn't heard before. Um, and I all I love that they took such joy out of Jack trying to ski because I found that in both his biography and in Jack's biography, they uh, with um, Joan Joni uh, that they both wrote about that as being like a crazy moment for them. So I, I enjoyed hearing that. Yeah. I, um, I always a big fan of hearing about the challenges that uh, Jack would give to Mel and be like, yeah, but you can't do this. <laughs> and of course, you know, the, the, this, this man with the most amazing vocal cords would just prove him wrong virtually every time. Although there's a great comment that came in the, uh, chat while we were uh listening to that was uh from our uh from straw hat chic uh he said i remember an episode where jack kept throwing out the an- animals until he got to an angry crocodile and was like i knew i could find one to stump mel <laughs> um so yes uh straw that is indeed a uh a thing uh the my favorite one is uh i bet you can't do an english horse um, and so that's when Mel went. <laughs> so there's just like a nice, uh, that's a nice one there. I yeah, love how I that, like that, one I, that one's so like, I mean, you watch enough interviews in the research process and that one never gets old because Jack laughs so hard every single time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, actually the, the, those bits between him and Jack, never get old i remember like i was on something and my friend just could see that i was stressed out beyond all belief so he pulled up youtube this was like 2011 2012 he pulls up youtube and he's just like here watch this and chill out and it was the seaside routine <laughs> so it was it was a nice like instant karma moment of like okay good or like instant like instant relaxation just like going like okay the world's going to be okay. I, I have just heard Mel and Jack in an airport doing the most ridiculous routine imaginable that always gets me giggling each time. So it's it was fantastic to sit down with Mel. And that's not the only, this is actually a very Mel Blank yeah. heavy uh, year, I hope, because we've got yeah. your video essay. Um, and then we've mm-hmm. also got other 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 things trickling down throughout the uh, uh, proceedings today so, and tomorrow and Sunday. So it's, it's, it's a nice way to kick off some tributes to Mel uh, with this lovely interview from Noel. I would like to say uh, thank you to Walden for also helping with that interview. I didn't say it at the beginning, but Walden was fantastic. 
um, with uh, some of the questions and uh, as always. And I also wanted to say also a coincidence, we have Rich Little, which I realize they're both called Man of a Thousand Voices. Well, they should have fought together in uh, Celebrity right. Death. <laughs> <laughs> Two clay figures. One's Mel Blanc, the other okay. one's Rich Little. And just watch them duke it out for five minutes. Um...